Hello, welcome to my channel. Another Bibliophile Reads. My name is Greg, and this is week 17 of my 100 book challenge, where I have challenged myself to read 100 books that I already own before buying another book. As of this morning, I am on book 84, or I should say, I've just finished book 84, and I'm reading book 85, a long 500-page novel that I need to finish reading by Wednesday morning. I am on the shores of Lake Mooney here in Virginia, and if you listen carefully, you can hear the geese honking in the background. And there they are over there. Well, anyway, let's see how far I get in my challenge during this week. I have finished my 85th book, End of Watch by Stephen King. This is the third in the trilogy of Bill Hodges. And it is really a direct sequel from the first, Mr. Mercedes. You, you do kind of have to read Mr. Mercedes before you pick up End of Watch, because there's a lot of detail in this plot that relates back to the first one. Maybe you could pick it up and read it on its own, but just read the trilogy. It's a fairly good trilogy. Um, my favorite is still the first, Mr. Mercedes, followed by Finders Keepers and ending here with End of Watch. In this one, you are following the, the villain from the first book. And um, he, he's not quite done with Bill Hodges and his crew of Holly and Jerome. Did I like this book? Yeah, it was fine. Um, it's, it's not one of Stephen King's best books. This one steers a little bit away from the crime mystery books of the first two of the trilogy and adds a little bit of the horror that Stephen King is so famous for. I think it worked just fine in this book, but again, it's never going to top my list. And this is part of my project all about Holly, where I'm reading all the books that feature Holly Gebney, um, one a month. And so next month will be The Outsider. By the time you see this wrap up, there will probably be a live stream that I have done with my crew that is reading all about Holly. And you can get more tea details on the book by watching that video. And I will leave it in the description. I have just finished my 86th book, The Moon Moth by Jack Vance, in the collection The Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 2B, The Greatest Science Fiction Novellas of All Time, edited by Ben Bova. I had not heard of this novella before. I had this collection for a long time, but it's just... um. I, I've never heard people talk about this, which is a shame because this is actually a very good novella. Um, it takes place on a distant planet. A, a man has been hired to be a counsel on this planet, and he is sent off with very little training. On this planet, the, the alien natives wear masks. Everyone wears a mask, and your mask is an indication of your prestige on this planet. People with low prestige wear lowly masks, and people with high prestige wear prestigious masks. Um, and he is given one of the lowest masks that you can possibly have on this planet. It is the moon moth mask. Say hello, Teddy. I'm just sitting here on the guest bed, reading my book, and um, I'm getting a lot of cat attention. Well, anyway, um, this council receives a what would be a um, intergalactic telegram from his bosses saying that an assassin is arriving on this planet and that he is supposed to go to the spaceport and detain this assassin immediately, or if he cannot detain him, kill him immediately. Unfortunately, his servants... Um, don't give him this message in time, 
And when he races to the spaceport, he learns that the assassin has um, gotten off the ship wearing a um, goblin mask. And um, this goblin mask has gone into a mask store and um, purchased a new mask. But because um, he is wearing the lonely moon moth mask, um, this mask maker does not give him information about um, what new mask the assassin is wearing. So he has to go back to his houseboat and sort of um, ponder what he's going to do. Then in the morning, the natives drag the body of an off-worlder to his houseboat. There are only four off-worlders on this planet, including himself. And he is making the assumption that the assassin has murdered one of the other off-worlders and taken his identity, which would be very easy because um, everyone wears masks. So you don't know the true identity beneath the mask. So now the, the council has to determine who the, the assassin is. So this is also a murder mystery. And I think it works kind of well as a murder mystery and a science fiction novel. I am glad I discovered this novel. A very positive review. And now back to Pip. I have finished my 87th book, The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammett, originally published around 1929 or 1930. It is one of the most famous hard-boiled detectives ever written, and it is one of the greatest, too. It is the story of Sam Spade in San Francisco. A beautiful woman comes into his office with a very peculiar story about how she needs Sam or his um, partner Miles Archer to tail a shady character and it is determined that Miles will tail the shady character except that night Miles turns up dead and the man he's supposed to tail also turns up dead and there you go on to the story you'll discover about the Blackbird you will meet Joseph Cairo, and of course, this is just a fabulous book. I, I really like this. This is about my third reread for this. And if you have not read this, this is just one of the books that should go to uh, close to the top of your list if you like mystery stories. Now, I did not pick this up by sheer accident. It so happens that the community I live in uh, has a lodge and there are a group of amateur players who are going to be reading the original radio play for this live. Now, when I say original radio play, I don't mean it came first. The novel came first and the radio play came after the novel, I'm pretty certain. But they're going to be reading that uh, radio play and I'm going to go see that Saturday night. So I decided um, I wanted to reread this novel. And I'm really glad I did. I have finished my 88th book, Little Black Sambo by Helen Bannerman. I picked up this book because I am doing the 24 in 24 challenge to read 24 banned books in 24. And Little Black Sambo may not be totally banned. It is certainly on the restricted and censored, and um, it's on the list of books that um, people say you should not be reading because, well, it has some issues. Now, I'm just going to talk about what I think about the book. I'm going to be doing a separate video about banned books, and I'll, I will leave all the, the sort of banned issues in that video. But this is a children's book, 
It was published in 1899. It is the story of a black child who's given some nice clothing and goes out for a walk in the jungle and he is accosted by tigers who want to eat them. And he has to exchange his clothing so the tigers don't eat them. And then the tigers all fight over his clothing. Now, I am not a person who normally would read children's books, so it's hard for me to judge the actual value as a story. As a story, well, it didn't excite me too much. It um, didn't have a lot of depth. But then again, it's for children um, in 1899. So I'm just going to leave it there. I will say that um, I picked this up on my um, huge CD-ROM of um, public domain books. I purchased a CD-ROM that was published in 2001 containing all the public domain books at that time, which includes Little Black Sambo. And I first read that this morning in just its text form. And just its text form, it's pretty innocuous. And then I downloaded um, the Project Gutenberg version, which is a little more up to date. And you can get the full illustrated version of Little Black Sambo in Project Gutenberg. And I will leave a link to that. A lot of this uh, band book's issues, what I'll just touch on, is, is from the illustrations. And I will show you one of the illustrations right now. Yeah, it's um, a little out of date to buy today's standards. But that's where I will leave it, because I will, I will talk about its uh, band worthiness in a later video. I have finished my 89th book. The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner by Alan Stilito, written in the 60s. This is the story of a youth sent to a borstal in the UK. That is a juvenile delinquency um, facility. And um, it is soon discovered that he is a very talented runner. And the warden wants to win a sporting competition. So he allows the youth to um, leave the facilities in the morning to run in the cold. This is mostly the narrator's thoughts. You do get the history of um, how he got to this borstal and um, generally what he thinks about life. It's actually really very well written and I can highly recommend it. I don't think it's super great, but it's, it's a very good little novella. I have finished my 90th book. This comes from the Science Fiction Hall of Fame, Volume 2A, narrated by Ben Bova, the greatest science fiction novellas of all time. And I read With Folded Hands by Jack Williamson, written in the 50s. This is the story of a distant planet. There is the main man named Underhill. He is the salesman for um, a robotics corporation. And robots, in this time, are really rather kind of flaky. They're good enough to get some household chores done, but not super intelligent. And then he discovers that there is a new firm that is offering humanoids that is coming from a planet that he does not recognize. Um, and these humanoids are absolutely fantastic robots. They can do everything. They are fully intelligent. In fact, these humanoids have been programmed to prevent humans or people from harming themselves or allowing them harm to be done to them. So um, essentially they take over the world. They take over all jobs and all the humans can do that is not considered able dangerous is sit at a table and play cards. Needless to say that people get bored of playing cards. Oh, how well I understand their pain, even if I don't have a humanoid to do all my household chores with. This is, again, a really fantastic novella. I am really enjoying this um, collection of novellas from the Science Fiction Hall of Fame. I have just read the two so far although there's some other novellas in there that I have read before, but not in these collections. I highly recommend it. 
the, with folded hands was a lot of fun to read, and I really dug the ending. Last night, I went to my community lodge, where some of the residents were putting on an amateur production of the Lux Radio Theater interpretation of Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon. This is basically verbatim from 1942, including the advertisements for, for Lux Theater Hose Cleaner, or whatever this Lux product was. So it was kind of fun. Um, and they did all the announcements as they would have done in 1942. And the players did a fine job. You know, they were not Humphrey Bogart. They were not Peter Lorre. But they did a fine job for, for residents in a retirement community. And I really enjoyed that, um, that, that production. My wife had not read the book before, but she said she could follow the story just fine. And in the radio play, they do cut some details, which is absolutely necessary because the radio play is one hour long, including the commercials. So you can actually listen to that radio play on YouTube. It'll probably, you know, be the, the, the real thing that you're listening to from 1942 and not the um, production that I saw, but seeing it live and seeing the residents dress up for the parts as best they can was just a whole lot of fun. I liked it. Not as good as the book, but I liked it. I have finished my 91st book, Sorry, Wrong Number, by Lucille Fletcher and Alan Ullman. It's coming from Alfred Hitchcock Presents More Stories, Not for the Nervous. This novel was originally written in 1948. It says so on the back. The complete novel is included in here. It's actually a novella. Well, anyway, there is a woman alone in an apartment in a New York City. She's a bit of an invalid and, and can't really get out of bed too easily without assistance. And her husband has not come home from work. And she's calling his place of business and getting the busy signal. Does anyone other than me remember the busy signal? I'm sure there's some old fogies like me who remember a busy signal. The youngins, maybe not so much. Well, she eventually gets the operator to try to break in on this busy signal. And she gets this weird conversation between two men who are plotting to murder a woman somewhere in New York City. Do you know where this story's going? Well, I kind of like this. Um, most of this novel is just um, the woman, the invalid, in her bed talking to people on the telephone. And I kind of like that setup. There's, there's no real action. There are things going on in the background. And there are some scenes that break away from the woman. And I kind of wish the author hadn't done that. I wish it would just been the woman talking on the telephone the whole time. I think that would have been a slightly better novel. But still, I really rather enjoyed this one. I have finished my 92nd book. This is a collection of short stories by Rath James White. I'm going to try to make the algorithm happy and not announce or say the title of this collection. Well, this was published in around 2008, 2006. And, and back in the early aughts, when you had a world horror convention, they had this event called uh, the Gross Out Competition. And the gross-out competition was try to read a five-minute or less short story to the audience to see which is the grossest short story of the year. And Rath James White won second place three times and fourth place once. And I, I want to sort of read you his description 
of what this collection is like. <laughs> Are you ready? I guess when I think of gross, putting my mouth on something covered in pus, feces, and disease is at the top of my list. You will encounter that in this book. Well, anyway, what follows are some of the sickest, most vile, and most despicable acts ever put in print. I kind of have to agree. It's just gross for being gross. They're sort of horror stories, but they're just nasty. And there is a bit of a comedic offense because I could just imagine these people going to this world horror convention and listening to people to read the gross out content, you know, gross out content stories and just being drunk as a lord and enjoying themselves. I didn't read this drunk, but I think reading these stories drunk or having someone read them to you when you are drunk would be the really preferred way to read these stories. I have finished my 93rd book, Transformations by Anne Sexton. This is a collection of poetry originally published in 1971. These poems are loosely based on some of the Grimm's fairy tales. And these are the good versions of the fairy tales, you know, where big toes are cut off and heels are cut off. People are cooked in ovens, those kind of fairy tales. But there are also poems beginning before she starts into the fairy tale, which is just her life as a poet. I think those are also very strong. Um, Anne Sexton is rather a good poet, I think. And um, I'm glad I read these. It was originally brought up in one of my live streams when someone was talking about her, her poetry based on Grimm's fairy tale. So I have picked these up and finished them. It's taking me about two weeks. I started them earlier. I was reading a poem or two a day just to get through them. And now that I'm done, I can highly recommend them. I have finished my 94th book, The Novella, The Events at Porth Farm by T.E.D. Klein, originally published around 1972 or thereabouts. It is a novella of a young university lecturer who's supposed to be reading a whole bunch of books for getting it ready for his college classes on Gothic horror. And he wants to get a very secluded area out in New Jersey, where all he has to do is read books all day long. Um, a place where there are no public transportation, no telephones, that sort of thing. And he rents this farm from a religious couple. They're sort of Mennonites or Mennonite-ish, not fully explained, but they're highly religious and, and basically live that rural lifestyle. But things start going wrong on this farm. The the, the the man and the wife own a bunch of cats, and Wanda, one of their gray cats, starts getting some very bizarre behavior after chasing down this weird creature that they thought was a mole but may not have been a mole. And then the, the narrator um, finds that cat dead in the woods, and it looks like something has eaten away it's out of her belly. But lo and behold, this cat shows up alive that night because the narrator didn't want to break the news that their cat had died. And now he can't say their cat has died because the cat is alive. And it gets stranger from there. I really like this. This is a very, very entertaining novella. It is also the basis for T. D. Klein's soul novel, The Ceremonies. It follows the in the footsteps of that novella pretty, pretty much. Everything that happens in that novella happens in this novel. Ending is a little bit different. But in this novel, um, he, he introduces a girlfriend for the narrator and a, and a very peculiar villain. This, this novel is actually pretty good. It does have some bloat and weaknesses. But um, I highly recommend the novel, too, even though I read this 10 years ago or so. Maybe not 10 years, remember, like eight years ago. The novella... I still highly recommend it. It, it is one of the classics of uh, modern horror literature. And, and definitely check that out if you can. Okay, that is a wrap 
for week 17. And I got through 10 books this week, even a long Stephen King book, which is 500 pages long, because um, I'm pushing hard to get this um, 100 book challenge done. I want it done. And I'm going into week 18 at book 95. I probably will not finish the challenge next week because the 100th book is going to be The Mammoth, 900-page Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts. But I'm also going to be in Mexico next week. There's lots of time to read at the beach, have some cervezas and some after-dinner tequilas. Thank you for watching and keep on reading.